not in the Bible. So we're in a series called That's Not in the Bible. And I want to give you a, a teaser for the final sermon in this series because we're going to take on the, the most popular misconception about what the Bible says. And I, and I say that because it's also the most dangerous misconception. It can literally threaten your relationship to God. So, so you need to watch the final message of this series. And I want you to, to make sure you, you, you do that because the gospel is going to be clearly declared in that message. So we're praying about that. But, but I am just as excited about what I'm going to share with you today. So I want to start it this way. There were these, these two older women. They'd been friends for years and they, they loved to go to church together. And they, they were after a service on one Sunday just out in the foyer of the church visiting about the things that happen as you, as you age and how things begin to fail, particularly like your, your memory. So one of the ladies is speaking to her friend and, and she says to her, I, I know this is embarrassing because I've known you for years, but I cannot recall your name. So what is your name? And her friend looks at her and says, do I have to tell you right now? It's amazing how our memories can fail to work. My, my wife is regularly stunned at, at things that I fail to remember in our marriage as we have been married for so many years and I'm not able to remember things and that frustrates her and it frustrates me to not be able to remember things. But, but let me tell you what can be equally frustrating to not be able to forget things that you wish you didn't remember anymore. And not only is it frustrating, but there can be a sense of condemnation with that. When somebody says to you, remember, the Bible says you're supposed to forgive and forget. Now, maybe that's a friend who's, who's actually trying to, to help you get over a wound that you have received. And they, and they say, the Bible says you're supposed to forgive and forget. And maybe it comes across almost like a, a rebuke from, from someone that, that actually hurts you, that, that they're upset because you haven't gotten past it, and you haven't moved on with your life. And they say, almost in a condemning way, remember the Bible says you are supposed to forgive and forget. Why do people think that the Bible says that? One possibility might be a verse that is found in the book of Jeremiah. The prophet spends most of the time in that book telling the people of Israel that they're going to go into captivity because of their rebellion. But, but at the end of the book, he, he gives a word of hope that God is, is actually going to bring them back. And there's this powerful word in chapter 31 of Jeremiah, where God says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, that sounds like God is saying, I'm going to forgive and forget. So I want you to hang on to that phrase, remember their sins no more, because that really is good news. And it, and it will encourage you if you remember how God remembers. Because the Bible never says, forgive and forget. In fact, let's, let's just begin with this thought. Forget about forgetting about it. Forgive and forget can do damage. For, for one thing, it can produce a sense of illegitimate guilt in people who are wounded and innocent. And I know this because I have preached on the problem of bitterness many times over the years. And every time I preach on the problem of resentment, I hear from people who feel guilty because they confuse forgiving with forgetting. And they think well, because I still remember that it happened, I must not really have forgiven yet. So they, they feel guilty about that. Another problem with forgive and forget is that it can minimize the need for the person who did wrong to repent and change. In fact, it can almost make it sound like you are wrong 
for not getting over the wrong, and, and your wrong is bigger than their wrong. But here is the biggest problem with forgive and forget. You can't do it. And, and God does not expect of us what he never enabled us to do. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and when God was knitting you together in your mother's womb, he put this amazing, wonderful thing called a brain in you. And he did not put in your brain a, a key that you could just press to selectively delete any painful memory that you have ever dealt with. We all have scars that we will never Forget the child that was abused will never forget that, nor should they be told that they should forget that. The teenager who watched a parent just walk out and abandoned them and their family is never going to forget that. The mate that was left by someone that promised to stay with them forever is never going to forget that. If, if someone destroyed you financially through deceit or fraud, you're never going to forget that. Nobody has the ability to just forget on command. The devil knows that. And he uses this against us. That's why the, the Bible calls him the accuser. Suddenly, the memory will come back of, of something that, that someone did and it was painful. Maybe even something you did that you have already asked God to forgive you for. And that memory begins to haunt you and the enemy just steps right into that memory and starts to condemn you. So this whole business of, let's just try to forget, that needs to be forgotten because it is not a wise strategy. Let me give you a better suggestion. Instead of forgetting it, let's decide to remember the right way. And the place to start is with God, because the answer to our problem is always good theology. In other words, the study of God. How does God remember and forget? What does the Bible say when, when it says God remembers or God forgets because God is omniscient and an omniscient being does not forget anything. So the Bible does not contain stories or details that God has forgotten. God forgave Israel for building the golden calf. God forgave David for committing the, the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. So when those stories show up later in the Bible, do you think that God sees that and says, I, I have no idea what that's talking about? Long lost thoughts and memories don't just suddenly pop into the mind of God. We Westerners, we're from the West, and, and we think of remember and forget as a, a mental activity. But remember, the Bible was written by Eastern peoples. And in Hebrew thought, remember and forget are action words. Now, let me illustrate that positively and negatively. A negative example is in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 9, verse 9. God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. God is telling the people, because of their rebellion, discipline is going to be coming upon them. And Hosea says, God will remember their wickedness. And this is a perfect example, by the way, of a Hebrew parallelism. The second half is the same, but it uses different words. God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. To remember is to do something. A positive example is from the book of Genesis, chapter 8. Noah and, and all the animals are on the ark and the flood has come and they've been on the floodwaters in the ark for quite some time. And it says in chapter 8, verse 1, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark and he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now, what does that mean? It was God visiting one day with one of the angels in heaven and all of a sudden says, oh my goodness, Noah! That's not how that happened. God remembered and he sent a wind 
over the earth and the waters receded. So, so when God remembers, it means that he renews his effort to work in that person's life consistent with his character and purpose. So he remembers your wickedness and he acts to discipline you and bring you to repentance. Or he remembers his promise and he acts to bless you and shower you with grace. But here's the point. When God remembers, God acts. So that is good. What does it mean then when God says, I will remember your sins no more? It doesn't mean that God forgets. It means that God will not now and God will not ever act toward you like you deserve. A woman named Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross. And there's a neat story, a friend who watched this encounter between Clara and a person who had done wrong to Clara, hurt her very, very badly, as a matter of fact. And Clara showed great kindness toward that woman and when the woman left, her friend comes up to her and she says, Clara, don't you remember what she did to you? And Clara said, no, I distinctly remember forgetting it. In other words, I recall what they did. But even more, I recall the decision that I made in my will to not act toward them on the basis of what they did, but on the basis of who I am. You can forgive somebody, but still remember what they did. Forgiving like God does not mean forgetting the past. It means creating the atmosphere and the possibility for a new and a better future. Because let's face it, some things have happened in your life. And if you're watching this on the internet right now, you know what I'm talking about. You are never going to forget some things that have happened to you in your past. But you can remember them the right way. What does that look like? How do you, how do you remember well? Well, here's the first key. My memory can be part of my testimony. It's hard to share what God has brought you through if you can't remember it. Part of what makes your testimony so bright is that it is against the backdrop of the darkness that you went through. So let me give you an example from the Bible. A man named Jacob has 12 sons. One of his sons, Joseph, is mistreated by all of his other brothers and he's sold into slavery where he goes through hardships in Egypt where he was sold. But God shows favor on Joseph, and he, he comes to power, and eventually, through Joseph's wisdom, he doesn't just save the nation of Egypt through a famine, he also saves his own family, and they all move down to Egypt. But then Daddy Jacob dies, and the brothers think, there is no way that Joseph has forgotten what we did to him. Now, he was kind while daddy was still around, but now that daddy's gone, Joseph's going to hammer us. So they come to him, and they bow down to him. And this is what Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. In other words, I'm not going to pretend that it didn't happen. It did happen. You did this. I didn't forget. You intended to harm me. What you did was wrong, but, but I choose to remember what God has done. And I'm going to let the memory of God's grace trump my hurt and my wrong. And his mess became his message. His test became his testimony. For forgiving is not pretending that it never happened. It's not pretending it didn't hurt. Forgiving is not saying that it wasn't bad. Forgiving is declaring that grace is that good. And memories of surviving a trial victoriously and showing 
how that wound that, that used to be an open wound has now become a scar, and a scar is always going to be visible, but it doesn't hurt like it used to. And that memory of that story somehow issues into praises being given to God. One of the examples of this in recent Christian history is with a woman named Corey Ten Boom. Many people know her story. You probably have seen her story. She and her sister Betsy were part of a strong Christian family in Holland, and they were hiding Jews from the Nazis when they were arrested and sent to Ravensbrück labor camp where they endured horrific evil. In fact, her sister Betsy died in Ravensbrück. So when the war is over, get this, God used Corey for the rest of her life to go around the world, especially into Europe and especially back to Germany, to preach the message of grace. And she saw thousands of people come to faith in Christ, not because she pretended that it didn't happen and, and that it wasn't that bad, but because she chose to lean into the grace of God, which, which trumped the memory of the wickedness that she endured. Think about this. What takes more love? To forgive someone who did something that you will never forget? Or to forgive someone for something that you can't even remember? I mean, you have had people, you're watching this, you have had people that have come up to you and asked for your forgiveness and you cannot even remember what it is that they're talking about. That didn't take much grace on your part. But when you forgive somebody for something that, that time will never erase, you have just magnified the grace of God in your life. That's what the accuser wants you to forget. So the next time that, that an awful memory comes into your mind, the devil is going to try to step into that memory. and He's going to try to beat you down and he's going to try to fill you up with a spirit of, of condemnation. And, and you're going to resist the devil and you're going to tell the devil, no, devil, that memory is not going to drive me into the sea of guilt. That memory is going to drive me to the throne of God's grace where I can rest in his work of grace in my own life. Because your memory can become your testimony. But forgiving and trusting are two different things. Forgiving is a gift. You say, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. If they deserved it, it wouldn't be forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift. By forgiving, we clean the slate so that a, a new future becomes a possibility. And it is critical that we forgive because if we do not, we will end up in a prison of resentment. It is non-negotiable for the believer. No matter what has happened, you must forgive. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is not an option, but reconciliation is. They're not the same thing. Forgiveness is a one-way street. Reconciliation is a two-way street. So you can completely forgive someone, but that does not mean that a new future is created because they might not want a new future. And forgiveness is not the cheap forgive someone and let them back into a relationship where no change, no repentance has taken place. So sometimes even though you completely forgive somebody, you you have to actually set up boundaries in the relationship. We understand this. No one that's watching this video would ever say to a child or a woman that has been in a physically violent situation, you need to forgive and you need to go back into that. Forgiveness is a gift. Trust is earned. 
Our memories are not our dictators. Our memories are our consultants. And we must not forget that the Holy Spirit is eager if we ask to give us wisdom as we live through these things that we cannot forget. Don't forget that the Holy Spirit wants to help you. And if you ask, He will help you how to best move forward with those things that you just can't forget. And if you are a follower of Jesus, that means that you must not forget the cross. It's not wrong to remember an injustice. And I've got to tell you, as a pastor, I have heard so many hard, hurt-filled, tear-filled stories of people who have said, because I, I could not forget it, I thought that God was still mad at me. It's not wrong to remember an injustice. But as you recall how somebody mistreated you, you must remember how God treated you when you were an enemy of God. Now, if the gospel is not true, and that whole Jesus died on a cross for our sins is a fairy tale, then it is okay for you to take matters into your own hands when you are wrong. V v vengeance is yours. But if the gospel is true, if Jesus really did die for your sins and you did not deserve that and he really did come back from the grave, then that has got to affect how you respond when you are done wrong. So let's go back to that story of Corey Ten Boom. It's 1947. She's preaching in Germany. Because she, she grew up in Holland, she, she loved metaphors about the sea, and one of her favorite verses was to preach how God has taken our sins and he has cast them into the deepest depths of the sea. She really believed that until she saw him. An older, balding, heavyset man in a trench coat walked forward with his hat in his hands, he didn't recognize her, but she immediately recognized him. He said, Fraulein, you mentioned Ravensbrück. I was a guard there. She didn't need him to tell her that. When you walk naked in front of a man who ogles you every day and you watch your sister die, you don't need him to tell you that. He said, Fraulein, since the war has ended, I have become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me, but I would ask that you do the same. So he put out his hand and he said, Fraulein, will you forgive me? And she writes about this in her book and she says it, it might have it might have been just seconds, but to me it seemed like hours. He, he held out that hand and there was nothing in me that wanted to grab his hand. Does he think with just a few words that that I'm supposed to forget that my sister died? But then she remembered what Jesus said. If you do not forgive others their sins against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. And she knew that forgiveness was not an emotion, it was an act of the will. So she prayed this amazing prayer in these few seconds as he's holding out his hand. God, I need your help. I can hold out my hand, but I can't make any feelings show up. So very, very woodenly, she put her hand into his. And then she said, it happened. She, she felt a current run up into her shoulder and just warmth all through her body was flooded over her. She says, I began to cry and I said, brother, I forgive you. I really forgive you. And she said that it was the greatest experience of the love of God that I have ever had in my life. Now listen to me. You're watching this video and you might be struggling right now with a memory in your own life. And Satan 
has used that memory to beat you up over and over and over again, to make you feel condemned. Maybe it's something that you did. Maybe it's something that was done to you. But it is real. And you are never going to be able to forget it. Don't take that memory and, and try to, to stuff it into a closet. Don't pretend that it never happened, but take that memory to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ and the supernatural gift of God's grace and the Holy Spirit shows up in this act and I cannot explain how this happens, but I am telling you somehow as you stand before the wounds of Jesus, you begin to be able to live with your own wounds in a healthier way. That's my prayer for you in this.